Hello, welcome back. Um, still Wednesday, December the 4th, 2019. My guest in this segment is Mark Nikanen of Extinction Rebellion. Um, we're going to start off this uh, segment with a video. Maybe you can just say a few words about it. It's about three former police officers, a couple of them very high ranking in England, who have joined Extinction Rebellion such a huge challenge, probably the biggest challenge humanity faces. A lack of action now is going to cost us far more in the future. What more needs to happen? I'm a retired police officer, the rank of chief superintendent. I was a detective sergeant in the Metropolitan Police. I ran our tactical aid group, which is the sort of equivalent to the Met's uh, TSG planning for emergencies. Had you told me five years ago, John, you'll be arrested, you'll be interviewed in a police cell, I would have laughed at you. We've just had the hottest month in history. You know, we really do face a climate emergency. I have a three-year-old called Natasha. I look at her and I can't help but wonder what the world will be like in 20 years' time. There are times where I really struggle. I have three children and I have a grandchild. The government and the media outlets must tell the truth about how serious these crises are. In a scenario where the climate has broken down, people fleeing from areas that are becoming uninhabitable for humans because they've become too hot or too wet. Food supplies are being interrupted. Then the role of the police is always to try and bring order. The security services, both police and the military as well, um, would be engaged in trying to stop people from basically killing each other for resources. Basic resources like food and water. I try not to think about it in the same way as I try not to think about her being involved in a car accident. Um, but uh, when she gets in the car, when she gets in the car, I put on her seatbelt. And so I think about climate change in the same way. I have to do what I can to try to make sure that she's going to be OK. In 20 years, when she is 23, and she will ask me, Daddy, what did you do? I hope that I can... The work that's been done by Extinction Rebellion and the work of the school strike movement has been hugely successful. My huge respect goes to them uh, for taking that step. Being locked up uh, in a police cell is not fun. I was arrested on uh, Waterloo Bridge during the um, April rebellion to be interviewed by officers who could have been me. It, it was the first big protest for me. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say I was out of my comfort zone but I did feel self-conscious because I you know was used to being on the other side of the protest line if you like. I will be having a role within the movement uh, liaising with the police during the actions. I'm here to call out the government to get them to do more, get them to do it faster. The question is what massive changes do you want? Changes that have been brought about by us changing the way in which we live? Or do you want those changes to come about by massive climate upheaval? Everybody says, there's nothing I wouldn't do for my children. Well, now is your opportunity. Which side of history are you going to be on? So, I mean, the first thing I thought when I saw that video on the internet was why is such a story that I found so important? Uh, it's just not, not out there. It's not only important, and you're right, it's also so compelling. I mean, honestly, I got a lump in my throat. I really did. Especially the man talking about his daughters. I mean, you see this young guy, and he's a lot younger than we are. And he's thinking 20 years ahead, right, Jack? And 20 years ahead is a crisis coming to a head. That's what we have to recognize about where we are now. So, you know, we're talking about crisis. Uh, on the world stage, nothing is changing except it's getting even crazier. So 
And, and I think it's already too late to avoid disaster, but at least we can hopefully avoid complete catastrophe. Um, but why is it a crisis? That's a really good question. Uh, Roger Hallam, who is the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, was wildly criticized when he talked about the fact that at the rate we're moving, we're going to lose most of the world's population, as in billions, that the carrying capacity of the planet may be a billion or less in the lifetimes of our children and grandchildren. That would represent an untold loss. In June, the UN came out and said that by 2050, there'll be 9.7 billion people on the planet. That's a lot of people. And we're talking about fewer than a billion people. We're talking about massive death, massive destruction, massive chaos. And the reason for that is painfully scientific and not that difficult to grasp. According to the Paris Courts, which as we all know, they're not mandatory. They're completely voluntary and they're not working because emissions keep going up. We're going to see a temperature rise by 2050 of 3.3 degrees Celsius. Now that's not counting the feedback loops from the permafrost, for instance, releasing carbon loads and methane loads into the atmosphere. It's not accounting for the massive melt in Greenland. Now just to deal with those two issues for a moment, what we're seeing in the Canadian North is unprecedented melting of the permafrost, 70 years ahead of what scientists originally thought. In, the Sib in Siberia, from 2007 to 2016, temperature increased up there one degree Celsius during that time. Now this is a lot of carbon. The carbon load in the permafrost alone on this planet is twice what we have in the atmosphere right now. And it's starting to come out. It is starting to come out. And, and the methane's not come, just coming out of there. It's also coming out of the Arctic Sea and wherever the waters are warming. And meanwhile, another reason that we're talking about crisis the way we are is that Greenland is melting. West Antarctica is melting. In Greenland, we're seeing the world's largest waterfalls because of the record heat they had this summer. It's just pouring down at a rate of one Olympic-sized swimming pool every three seconds. That's fresh water going into the North Atlantic, diluting the salt, which will only slow the Gulf Stream down even more because the weight of the water without that salt won't keep that entire conveyor belt Most moving. people don't know about the Gulf Stream, but just very basically, it's the stream that brings warm water from the south to the north. And it, it's, it's vital for everything, and it's slowing down, which means less heat will be coming out of the south, the north will get colder, and the south will cook, I guess. That's right, yeah. that's right. So we're in, I, I mean, if I say we're in a crisis and anybody's yeah, watching, yeah. But if anybody's watching, I'll say, what crisis? You know, nothing's changing. Everything is exactly the same as it was. You know, our government isn't talking about it. The media isn't talking about it. The movies aren't talking about it. I mean, if you're, if you're in the general public, as we all are, there's nothing out there to suggest that there is a crisis and it's already too late. I mean, shouldn't we be on a war footing? And yet nothing's happening. It's well, crazy. Well, I think that's what we uh, in Extinction Rebellion, Vancouver Island, and elsewhere, we're in um, 70 countries now, that's what we're saying. We should be on a war footing. There's no question about it. Because if we don't get a hold of it in the next few years, I mean, look at it this way. It's calculated, scientists are telling us, that we have to cut greenhouse gas emissions 8% a year, every year, until 2030, starting now. We're not cutting. We're increasing greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. We're doing it here in Canada, too. So we're not only on the wrong track, we are literally putting a, you know, a noose to the collective neck of humankind. Yeah. So we obviously need leadership in right directions. We're not getting it from our governments or our politicians or the media or anywhere else. I mean, it's just not happening. You guys are in the streets um, just trying to cause... A conversation. Yeah, yeah. And bringing... We're trying to sound alarm bells. Yeah. Because this 
is a fire situation. Yeah. The planet is, we don't even call it global heating, I mean global warming anymore, it's global heating. And I think we should stop calling it climate change too. The Guardian newspaper was great in taking the charge lead on that. It's climate chaos. Yeah. You know, it's climate, climate catastrophe, but you climate don't hear crisis. That. Unfortunately, you don't, you don't hear it. Instead, what we have in Canada is, hey, let's all get together and build another pipeline. I mean, the power of the oil industry and the banks behind them and everything else to control the story, to completely hide the story that you and I are talking about, to hide the crisis which massively imperils the future of everybody's children. That's not, you know, you know ho-hum, but the country's going to come apart if we don't build pipelines and, and LNG here in BC, which is even crazier. I know. It really is, commits us to fossil fuel use for a long time to come if we continue on the path we're on. And unfortunately, everything that you're saying is correct. I think that what has to happen is, first of all, we're getting a lot of signals, okay? The Sahara Desert has jumped the Mediterranean. Southern Europe, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece are all experiencing desertification, okay? The southwest of the United States is in like a permanent drought at this point. I mean, we are seeing these kinds of conditions all over the planet. In Canada, we're warming up at twice the worldwide average. Now, people are fond of saying, that's great, we don't mind these milder winters and we'll just grow crops, but it doesn't work like that. It's not a benevolent kind of thing. Granted, Canada is probably a better place to be than in the tropics, but it's not going to be a picnic here either, especially, especially when the United States, which is going to be hammered, it is being hammered by yes. climate change, especially when you have 300 plus million people armed, angry, deprived, looking for food and water. I'm sorry, I know I'm a dystopian novelist, but the point is, that kind of stuff is going to be real if we don't get a grip on this now. And that's, I don't know what we can do except what we're doing, Jack. Get in the well, streets okay. and... So, but the reason you're getting in the streets is to turn the politicians around. So let's say you were suddenly the Prime Minister and King of Canada yeah. and the Premier of BC I as like well. I like this. Okay, so <laughs> what do we do? I mean, one thing I see us doing is immediately start to move away from cars and, and to trains and mass transit. Absolutely. In fact, that reminds me of something that uh, Governor Jerry Brown talked about back in 1992 when I was his press secretary when he was running for the Democratic nomination for president. We won't hold that against you. Oh, we'll try not to. But anyway, he was spot on, though, talking about the need to put in tra trains yeah. and hook up every major city within 300 miles of each other so we can get these planes out of the air and get the trains moving. That infrastructure is huge. But here's the problem that we're faced with now. We're now getting to the point where the carbon load from building massive infrastructure may offset the benefit. We're not there yet, but if we don't get a grip on this very, very soon, that ratio is going to not be working in our favor. So the, the carbon load from, yeah. the build. So really what we need is just less. We need less of everything. The, the lifestyle we have is... Uh, Killing, is gonna kill is, our children. Yeah, it's, it's ending. You know, I, I had a package of uh, sunflower seeds, paper, mm -hmm. and inside the paper there was metal foil yeah. and printed on it as a beautiful picture and lots of words and all this, all to hold a couple of handfuls of sunflower seeds. We can't do that anymore. Uh, we, in fact, we couldn't do it for the last hundred years, but we did it. And, and the price that we're going to pay, every, everything on the earth is going to pay, is not going to be pretty. We have to really rethink our economies. We have to really rethink the notion of what is growth. And especially we have to really think about how we have provided subsidies to industries for so long by letting them just spew carbon into the atmosphere. We can't keep doing that. And I'll say this about our two of our top politicians, John Horgan and uh, Justin Trudeau. They are complete phonies. You know, they are as much a part of this as the oil companies are. They work for the oil companies. They are willing, as our political leaders, to basically murder us and the future in order to keep their cushy jobs. That's where we're at. Trudeau did nobody any favors by buying the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And that's not true. Especially Canadian he, taxpayers. He did well, Kinder he, Morgan a big yeah, favor. Yeah, that's right. Kinder, Kinder Morgan did real well on that. Yeah. But the taxpayers are getting hammered on that one. 
And one thing that doesn't get talked about much is the fact that the taxpayers are paying half of the interest on the loan for that TMX and another $1.5 billion on an ocean certification program. Why is that necessary? Because of all the tankers that will be going in and out of the Inland Sea. Yeah. Well, so it sounds like everything is going as planned. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mark, thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Yeah. It's good to see you. Yeah. And it's a mess, folks. I don't know what we can do, but let's hope. Let's keep screaming. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.